Funding for this program was provided by the National Institute of Justice. Hello, I'm James Wilson. Crime is a chronic problem for many of the three and one half million Americans who live in public housing. Robberies, burglaries, assaults, and rampant drug dealing are everyday occurrences that turn corridors and public spaces into danger zones. Arrayed against these conditions are housing authorities, police agencies, and public housing residents. They are seeking ways to control crime and assure a decent quality of life in their communities. One factor, the physical environment, what a public housing complex looks like. Another factor, the type and extent of law enforcement, whether the police are remote from tenants or work closely with them. And still another, the amount and intensity of tenant involvement. All these factors play a role in Boston. This is what many people visualize when they think of public housing. Bare dirt, stark concrete, ugly brick. Temporary warehouses for poor people. When Mission Hill was first built in 1952, it was hardly beautiful, but it was at least clean and relatively safe. But that was before an epidemic of drug abuse destroyed the tenant's way of life. The milkman used to come, the insurance man used to come. I mean, everybody used to come to your door and sell this and that. It was really nice. It was a mixed neighborhood. We had blacks and whites here. It was real pretty. They, the grass, everything. This place was clean. And then when we got the drug problem, they robbed the mailman. They robbed the insurance man. The gang just started ripping them off, and they stopped coming. Throwing people off the roofs, finding people dead in the elevators, you know, mm -hmm. going up the staircase and maybe someone laying there dead. It was really rough. They've become addicted to crack, and they've gone right to hell, physically, emotionally, mentally. It's, it's unbelievable what one drug can infect the community. Mission Maine, as this development is called, is a tough beat. Drugs are sold openly. Law enforcement is stretched. There are only 26 housing authority police for all of Boston. But it doesn't have to be that way. Just down the street, on the site of the old Mission Hill extension, the rebuilt and renamed Alice Taylor Apartments seem part of another world. The renovations were pushed through by a tenants task force at a cost of roughly $20 million. One of those tenants was Hattie Dudling. You have to take on an attitude that says we're not going to take it anymore and that we're going to do what we have to do to make a difference. And we brought about that change because, first of all, it started with one person and then everybody else said, well, yeah, I can go along with that. And then the residents formulated a group and said, well, we can stick together on this. We all can come together. And we have made a difference because we stuck together. Looking at some things in development, talking about the design of all the years. Curtis Jones was manager of Mission Hill Extension when the renovations began. He is now oh, director well, of public you know, safety well. for the Boston Housing Authority. You take care now. People expect public housing to look bad. That isn't our attitude. We expect it to look good. Uh, because the better it looks, the better the environment, the better the attitude. The better the attitude, the less the crime. Um, so we use the general standards that everyone goes by of what you would like in your own personal communities. Most apartments have their own entrances, not common corridors where criminals can slip in one door and out another. Peaked roofs have replaced flat roofs, removing another potential police problem. Low fences, green grass, shrubs and trees, all designed to encourage tenants' pride and discourage criminal behavior. 
Abandoned cars are towed away. Broken lights and windows are promptly fixed. Even new graffiti is removed within 24 hours. Graffiti, anything that shows a mismanagement, we try to attack um, because it's important that the residents know someone's in control. We cannot give up control to drug dealers, to give up control to, again, the, the negative pieces of society. Tenants and housing officials strive for a family atmosphere with playgrounds, tennis courts, and programs for young people. What happens is um, when, when young people feel good about where they live, just like older people, then they don't mess up as much. I mean, when you have an outlet for the energy, you know, all the negative stuff kind of gets put on the back burner. A new relationship between law enforcement and tenants also had to be established. Before, it was always like a tug of war with the police. So we wanted to make them be comfortable in here, let them know that everybody wasn't bad people because they viewed us all as, as thugs, you know, and we were not all thugs. We've solved murders. Uh, we've cut the drug problem. And it's all been with tenants' help. They're our eyes and ears. And we will send in an undercover officer to see if he can make a purchase. Should he make a purchase of drugs from that unit, uh, immediately we go forward with getting a search warrant for that unit. And within a short period of time, approximately 24 to 48 hours, uh, we end up serving that search warrant. I'm scared of the drug dealers, but if I see them doing something, I will tell. Because it's best to be scared, you know, I'm scared of her if I don't tell them because it might hurt one of my kids. And all it takes is that one person making an attitude change and then another person making an attitude change. And if the whole task force make it, you don't need everybody in the development making an attitude change either. You just need five to six people and you got it. People have to have ownership. They have to have a sense that it's theirs and it has to be beautiful. There's no reason to have it looking as if it's unkept and not maintained by anyone. And that's been our major focus, is to change the mental attitude of people by changing the environment. We started out afraid, scared, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden we said, no, no more. We have to live here. We have no place else to go. It's time to fight back. And that's what we did, and we're going to fight to keep it. With me to discuss these matters are Vincent Lane, chairman of the Chicago Housing Authority, Major Carolyn Robeson of the Tulsa, Oklahoma Police Department, and Hattie Dudley of the Tenants Task Force at Boston's Alice Taylor Apartments. Ms. Dudley, you have been part of a movement that has transformed the public housing project, yet right down the street, as we saw in the film, there is in the same neighborhood another public housing project that doesn't look anything like uh, Alice Taylor Homes. Apart from the physical changes, what would you say is the key factor that has been responsible for the transformation of conditions in your project? Basically, the reorientating of our families to family living and having them come together to work on the issues that we're confronted with. How do you get people to come together? Well, once people see that we've made a physical change, people feel that it's a need, it is their responsibility to come together and that they give what's needed. What do they do for you? Basically come like talk in meetings, say what's going on, you know, give reports to the police, come to meetings and speak openly with the police about what's going on in the neighborhood. When they see somebody um, vandalizing in the area or painting graffiti or loitering, or doing things that create problems for the neighbors. Are, are they willing to speak out, tell the people face to face, stop that, this is our home, or do they have to rely on the police to make that? I think it depends on who's doing the graffiti or doing the, the crime at the time. Uh, if it's just a kid with a can of paint, then they probably confront the kid. But if it's a gang member or someone who they feel will put them in danger, they probably would call the police, you know, and not give their name, but call in the incident. As uh, somebody said on the program earlier, the view that many people in the United States have is that public housing projects are, are filled with criminals and therefore they're hopeless and so society tends to turn their back on it. Now you have lived in Mission Hill, you are a resident and you're a tenant organizer. What proportion of the tenants in your project in Alice Taylor Homes would you say are in some sense troublemakers? This is a small proportion of troublemakers that live there, and everyone else are decent law-abiding citizens, and, you know, they're looking to live and, and be an American. What 
where do the drug dealing, where does the drug dealing come from? Is this something that is started by one or two tenant residents, or is this outsiders coming into the project? I think it's outsiders who come in, and certainly some of our people get roped into this, you know, knack of having more money and new sneakers and all those kinds of things, but it starts with some outsider. Now, if you find a tenant that is acting in an undesirable way, participating in drug dealing or criminality, what legal options are open to you or the housing authority to have that person evicted? Well, in Boston, there's a new law on the book. If a person's dealing drugs from their home you know, or in and around their, any public housing, they can be evicted within 24 hours. Um, what we usually do as a tenant organization is I'll go and talk to that tenant and say there's been some you know, reports on your action and give them an opportunity to clean that up so that they get it legally as well as you know, informally. Now, have you ever been the object of any threatened retaliation from people who don't like the fact that drug dealing is no longer welcome at Alice Taylor Homes? All the time. And um, does that worry you? It doesn't worry me, in fact, because um, a lot of other people who, who, who's there to support me, you know, provide me with the support I need to kind of keep going and say, do it again. Has there actually been a retaliation against anybody since this program began? I don't think there's been any retaliation. I probably had a couple of tires cut, stuff like that. A couple of tires yeah. cut, but, but not no, new. Well, no physical. It. I see. What about selecting new tenants to come in? Obviously, if you're emphasizing family values and working together in a community way, you would like tenants coming in who share those. What process exists for screening people to make sure that the right kind of tenant comes into Alice Taylor Homes? Well, as a part of the Housing Authority now that we've been negotiating with them over several years, and there is an inclusion now of criminal record check and also, um, you know, tenant payment, like how they pay their rent. So there's a severe process of what you have to do now to have references to get into public Let housing. Let me ask some of the same questions to Vince Lane, who runs one of the largest, if not the largest, public housing authorities in the country, and that's uh, the Chicago Housing Authority. Uh, what proportion of your facilities would you say have been transformed into the kind of livable conditions that we see in the Alice Taylor homes in Boston? How much progress have you made? Well, I'll tell you, Jim, we've, we haven't made that much progress in terms of what I have saw uh, here with Alice Taylor. But we have taken uh, uh, about 21 of our high-rise buildings, and we have about 125 troubled high-rise buildings in Chicago and made we've taken 25 of those buildings and made them livable. And how do you do that? We do it through something called emergency uh, housing inspections, uh, uh, otherwise known in Chicago as Operation Clean Sweep, where we will go into a, ga a gang-infested, uh, drug-dealing, high-rise environment, and uh, together with the Chicago Police Department, utilizing their staff and our staff, about a total of a, of a almost 100 people, create lobbies, because there are no lobbies in our high-rises, um, and uh, issue photo ID cards uh, to residents, go through every apartment, identify unauthorized occupants of the apartments, uh, get them off the property, uh, and then follow up with a thorough cleaning of the building, uh, getting rid of urine in the stairwells, painting the uh, galleries, and uh, putting lights throughout the property. For years, the Chicago Housing Authority had the reputation in the country of having uh, some of the worst managed public housing projects in the country. I don't know if that's a fair statement. You are a relatively recent appointee. Was that reputation deserved? And if so, why were conditions that bad? Well, I think the rep reputation was deserved. Uh, clearly, uh, when I uh, uh, came to the Chicago Housing Authority, uh, there was poor management, terrible management. Uh, employees were hired not because of the job they could do, but because of who was, was their political sponsor. Uh, contractors uh, took our, our funds and didn't deliver uh, quality work or no work at all. And uh, there were a few residents who received perks, and, uh, and, and, but the masses of residents were basically uh, not uh, 
given service. So you've had to try to professionalize the entire management of the Chicago Housing Authority. That's correct. Well, many of us recall uh, the incident uh, many years ago when a high-rise public housing project in St. Louis, the pruitt Igo project, became so bad the authorities uh, moved everyone out and dynamited it and the whole right. building fell down. Is it possible to have effective community life in a high-rise building in a city such as Chicago, or is the high-rise itself an enemy of public safety? Well, that is, of course, a, 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 a topic of great debate around the country. I personally believe that it is not the bricks and mortar that make the difference in, in public housing life. It is people. And uh, I believe that, yes, you can have a decent live, uh, life in a high-rise building. What have been your relationships with the police? You have a housing authority police and you have the Chicago Police Department. Do they appreciate what you're trying to do? Do they work effectively with you? Well, there's no question about it. In fact, uh, our housing authority police was just created. And it was created, uh, the first class graduated in March of, of, uh, of this year, and uh, of, 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 of 90. And uh, we got that class through with the help of the Chicago Police Department. So they're looking for help from us uh, and don't view us as competition but as a, a complement to, uh, to their police efforts. Major Robinson, uh, in my years of riding around with the police and listening to police talk in the locker room, uh, and not as many years as you've had at that role, you get the impression that many police departments believe that persons in public housing projects are uh, are really out of control and that the job of the police is try to contain it, set up a barrier around it, but not actively work with the residents to help manage that. Have you noticed that change in any substantial degree? Well, I think that is changing with the, with the emphasis towards uh, community policing that's going on uh, today. Uh, we have discovered that, that policing from the perimeter does not work, that it's going to spill over, that, uh, and, and for the sheer fact that, that the people who live inside public housing are not what uh, the police perceive them to be. And the only way to, to discover that is for the police to get in, get out of their cars, talk to the people, and work with them. How easy <coughs> is it to get police officers out of their car to walk around and talk to people in public housing projects? Mm. Well, it's, it's um, <clears throat> difficult, I guess, uh, uh, at the moment, but uh, as I said, as, as, they, as they do these things and get out and discover what, what the reality is and adjust their strategies to that and see that those strategies work and that they can make a difference in these complexes, it becomes easier and easier. And how do you manage to patrol in a public housing project when, at least if it's a high-rise building or even a large building generally, so much of the community life of the building occurs in the corridors. It doesn't occur in public spaces. Can you patrol corridors? Well, the officers have to get out of their car. Um, foot patrol is, is one of the things that works very effectively, I think, in public housing in those kind of situations. They just, the, the police cannot do it from their vehicle. They have to get out, go to tenant meetings, talk to the tenants, and then you find that you get a lot of information that helps you uh, uh, direct your energies to those quarters. And, uh, you know, there may be uh, a, a drug enforcement effort that has to go on, but it cannot go on in isolation without the community involvement. Let's talk about how you follow up on the drug enforcement strategy. Mm -hmm. What are your powers in a public housing project to stop and frisk tenants that you suspect are involved in drug dealing? Well, uh, we would have to be able to articulate, you know, the circumstances under which we were, we were doing the stop and frisk. Um, if it's a known drug area where a lot of, of drug arrests have been made, um, and particularly on the corner, and there's certain actions that are associated with that, then sometimes there are, uh, I know some, some um, uh, cities have gotten legal descriptions and laws created that, that allow the officers to But you to have stop to be acting that. on the basis of reasonable suspicion, not just yes. a guess. Yes, and it can't be, you know, they have to be doing, engaging in some kind of overt activity. Mm -hmm. And when you do a stop and frisk, uh, do you find that this helps reduce drug trafficking or is something more dramatic call for? How do you deal with the problem beyond simply containing it? Well, as I said, you have to get the tenants involved. They have to be willing to take a stand and it's all, it's all, the, the, the issues are all very interrelated. Um, you know, you can't just go in and wipe out drug, drug dealing because it's, it's connected so with the, with the way of life in, in public housing. And that sometimes I know that we've discovered that a lot of times when we take the drug dealers out, we're also taking out transportation for the, uh, for the tenants and a lot of um, 
uh, items like that. So you have to go in and you have to network with the entire community, the social service agencies and the housing authority to bring in um, those programs and services that you're actually taking away from them. Let, let me talk about a, a larger aspect of this issue. We've been talking about what the tenants can do, what housing authority officials can do, what the police can do. Is a more fundamental change necessary, Ms. Dudley? Would it be desirable, for example, if the tenants owned or managed their own public housing projects so it was their property that they were defending? I think it is. I think they have to have a sense of ownership, whether they own it or not. I think it is also conceivable that uh, tenant management is possible if the development is small enough to be managed uh, by the residents. I also would caution that we would not like to just say manage properties that don't have the resources with it, so that management is a possibility with proper resources. So that if you were to manage it as a tenants organization, this would require an additional level of resources or certainly no reduction in resources for this to work properly, is that what? I think we would need some additional <coughs> uh, resources. What about owning it? What if somebody gave you a chance to buy it out under some subsidized loan basis? Would this be desirable? Well, because our development has recently been redone. I think it is a desirable process for us to look at. Um, but I would not suggest that tenants go out and own something that needs to be rehabbed and a lot of money put into it. Mr. Ling, what is your experience or what are your thoughts about tenant ownership or tenant management? I think it's the, the foundation of turning around public housing in this country. Uh, clearly, if the residents don't want a better life, no matter how many billions of dollars you put into it, you won't get a better life. Uh, in Chicago, I've encouraged it. We have seven resident management corporations in Chicago, one of which has been managing uh, it, the, its entire development for over a year now. How does that work? Take that uh, one example and tell me briefly how it works. Well, what happens is we uh, 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 enter into an, uh, an agreement with the residents of, of a development uh, and then we start working with them along with their own private technical assistance providers to give the, to train them in real estate management uh, and leadership training and so forth. Uh, and then after they've come along uh, a, a pretty good uh, uh, distance in terms of, of knowledge, we enter into a, a, a dual management role with them where we have our staff and residents performing the same duties for a period of one year. And then we literally give the keys uh, to the resident management group, um, and they receive the same resources as any other development in our system. And uh, they of course, then hire the housing manager. They hire all of their own employees. They set their budgets. Uh, uh, they hire the contractors to uh, provide uh, 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 maintenance uh, work or repair work. Has this worked out in this case where it's been done? It is. It is the results are very, very satisfying. And is, do you see any pitfalls along the way? Ms. Ms. Dudley said that tenant management only works if there's an appropriate level of resources. Do you see that there's a resource problem here in doing this more widely? Well, clearly, uh, uh, a couple things uh, could present problems. One, the development is too massive, and the surrounding uh, neighborhood has problems in it. That could be real, uh, a real troublesome situation for residents who are just beginning to, to, to uh, get into management. Uh, the other thing is, if there's a significant backlog in terms of deferred maintenance, where you've got an, un, you know, an unusual amount of problems that occur. So I think you have to pick the development and pick the environment that the development is in. Uh, where residents can truly be affected. Let me ask you a question that came out of something that uh, Ms. Dudley said. She talked about the advantages of a small unit that facilitates management, facilitates improvement. Chicago uh, built high-rise buildings up and down State Street. Uh, is it feasible, given political and economic realities, to add public housing in a city such as Chicago in small units on small scattered sites. Is that a feasible option? It absolutely is. And, and what kind of resistance do you get from neighborhoods that say, oh, well, we don't want public housing in our neighborhood? Well, I think we get resistance because of the history of the Chicago Housing Authority. And one of the things that we're doing to try to overcome that, as we build scattered site housing, I'm turning that scattered site housing over to pri local private developers and nonprofit community development corporations. We, in fact, are even letting them build the housing to lessen the fear of the community that the, uh, once it's built, 
that it won't be managed properly. Let me ask uh, Major Robeson uh, something about this. You've traveled around the country as well as worked in Tulsa on the problem of getting the police into closer relationships with the communities. Uh, if you were dealing with the police from a big city such as Chicago has these massive high-rise public housing projects and a long-time reputation for having problems, what would you tell the police that could possibly overcome their concern that if the first day they go in there, somebody's going to be on the rooftop taking a shot at them? I mean, how do you overcome those concerns? Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> it's, it, it's one thing that would have to take a very, very long time, certainly not going to happen overnight, but I know that uh, our experience in Tulsa was to... Uh, to convince them to try, you know, and, and like I said, one success builds upon another. Um, we sent um, foot patrol in, I guess, with uh, daily threats that uh, bad things were going to happen to those foot patrol, and the threats never became a reality. Not saying that they wouldn't, you know, maybe in a, in a much larger city with um, bigger problems than what we were experiencing. But uh, if, if the police are fearful of going in and uh, fearful of taking on the problems there, then, then there is no one left, you know, to go in and handle those things. And so I think you have to appeal to their sensitivity. Do you see the police's attitude toward the residents begin to change? Do they begin to make more precise distinctions in their mind between, so to speak, the good guys and the bad guys after they have met more tenants? Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I think the real problem is, is the generalization and the, and the uh, perceptions that the police have initially, you know, of going in feeling that uh, everybody that lives in public housing is against them. And once they discover that everyone is not and that there are a lot of good people there who are being victimized, that, um, that can appeal again, you know, to the sensitivities of the police who, who feel like they are there to protect the innocent. Have you seen in Boston this problem of perception in the Boston Police Department that they're a little reluctant, a little suspicious, a little concerned about meeting you halfway on your territory? Yes, it has been, but we've put a lot of time and effort into making sure that they are comfortable and that they know the people in the neighborhood that they can get support from immediately. From. What would, in your judgment, be the single most important thing that government or society at some level could do to take the improvement in public housing to the next stage? What is it we most need today? I guess respect. I think we need to respect each other and begin to realize that we are all people and what we all are looking for is a decent life. And that's all. And not a vast more, vastly more resources or su some new scheme. We, this has to be done at a people-to-people -people basis. That's right. People-to-people. People. You're not turning down more money right no, here. No, we're not. You're not turning it down, but you no. don't think that's the key to it. I don't think that's the key. I, I think that that's helpful, but I don't think that's the key. What would be your answer to this question, Mr. Link? What is the one thing that the society or government could most do to make a difference right now? I think to uh, give residents respect and to... Uh, change the way we deliver public housing and that is not stack poor people on top of poor people. We need a socio-economic mix. We need to build housing that poor people can live in and not housing for poor people. I see. And the socio-economic mix is something that doesn't exist today in many communities. That's exactly right. Thank you ladies and gentlemen and thank you for watching for Crime File. I'm James Wilson. Crime File is a production of CF Productions Incorporated, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for this program was provided by the National Institute of Justice, research arm of the U.S. Department of Justice.